What's up guys, today we are talking 3D Legos and how fun it is to build your own in BrickLink Studio, push them to the max in your favorite 3D programs like Cinema 4D or Blender, and even how to composite them into live action footage. Because over the last month, I have been working on this Lego passion project. It combines my longtime love for building Legos, 3D and VFX work, and visual storytelling, and I cannot wait to show you guys the final film when it drops later this summer. But in this video, I'm excited to walk you guys through this unique 3D to 2D workflow and see how you use all the tips and tricks we're gonna cover in your own projects. So it all started with this book, The Lego Engineer by Jeff Friesen. I was immediately drawn to these beautifully designed, studio lit, micro scale Lego builds of real world objects. I just wanted these perfect little creations in my life and thought how cool would it be to composite these 3D micro scale Lego builds into live action footage. And what's a cooler place to shoot footage in than Japan? So my wife and I embarked on a road trip from the hustle and bustle of Tokyo to the serene Gifu countryside and beyond to Kyoto, the city of shrines and temples. And along the way, I made a habit of filming whatever piqued my interest with this Lego concept in the back of my mind. And I wanted to be as open to wherever the idea took me, regardless of whether I thought it could work for the so-called edit or not. And I made it a goal of making this the exploration phase of the project. I didn't need to judge the work yet. I just told myself, look, have fun with this and shoot. Let the future me take care of what's good or what's bad. And after two weeks of travel, I had compiled about 50 or so solid shots and I was more than excited to start the VFX process on. So let me take you guys through a couple of my favorite shots, starting with the Lego building process. Pretty quickly, I realized how difficult it was to make these micro scale Lego masterpieces. Just based on the references I pulled alone, it's easy to see that these are masterfully crafted works of art. If I wanna get this short film done this year, I need to team up with someone who knows every single piece. I need someone who knows all the tricks inside and out. I need a Lego building master. But who and where? Paul. Hi Clint, how you doing? Man, I, I need help. That's what I'm here for. Paul Lefford has been building Legos for decades now, and his micro-scale architecture builds are a testament to that. He's surrounded by all the physical pieces in his office, so he can brainstorm complicated ideas, and he's proficient in a CAD-style Lego software called BrickLink Studio. It's clear to me that Paul is the man for the job. So let's get building. Using BrickLink Studio, it's free. You can download it. It's in the description. Paul's gonna build out the giant Shinto shrine that's hanging above the center of the ring inside Tokyo's famous sumo hall. I tried to build this out myself and man, it is harder than it looks, guys. Paul's process is pretty cool. At a certain point, if he gets stuck in BrickLink Studio, he'll turn to the physical pieces to troubleshoot and brainstorm, then back to studio where he can finish things out. Now, it's just as easy as exporting a Collada file from BrickLink Studio, converting that file to an FBX using this ancient Autodesk converter. Don't worry, it's free and link below. That way we can bring it into Cinema 4D, Blender, Unreal, whatever, so we can move on to the next step, getting it lit, getting it textured, and getting it aligned to the live action shot. But first, let's take a couple seconds to admire Paul's beautiful handiwork. Paul crushed this sumo hall shrine. It turned out so nice, not to mention all these other genius builds for other shots in this short film coming out soon. But in the meantime, if you guys wanna see exactly how Paul built these custom Legos, he's got a video on his channel covering the entire process. And he even made custom instructions so you guys can build those Legos yourself if you want. I got the video linked below. Go show Paul some love, especially if you're a Lego fan, because he's got you covered with all the awesome videos on his channel. Channel. So let's light texture and align our model to our footage. I'll use Cinema 4D, but you guys can just as easily use Blender since it's free, of course, or any other 3D software to accomplish the same steps. First, let's match our 3D camera to the original shot so that our Lego model sits correctly in the footage. Luckily, since all of these shots are simple nodal pans versus free moves, I don't need to 3D track these shots. I got tutorials and all that stuff if you need it, but for us, I'll simply make a camera, right click, and add a camera calibration tag where we can add our reference image, select the various axes in our reference frame, set a center point, and BAM! Aligned. If you're in Blender, I know FSpy does the same exact thing, so check out FSpy. Also got that link below for you if you need it. 
Now that our camera is aligned and matched, let's match our 3D lighting to the lighting in our footage. But first I gotta give Asus some love for sponsor in this video. For the traveling artist, having a solid mobile workstation is almost as important as the at-home desktop. If you're in the market for a laptop, hear me out, because you can easily knock out projects like this on their new ProArt StudioBook 16 OLED laptop. It's equipped with a gorgeous color accurate 16 inch 3.2K OLED touchscreen display, and its color accuracy is graded at Delta E less than one, which means its color accuracy is beyond what the human eye can even perceive. The 120 Hertz true black display is perfect for creating on the go 3D art while simultaneously giving you the best gaming and movie watching experience. It comes loaded with a 24 core Intel processor with clock speeds up to 5.6 gigahertz, making 3D tasks like simulation a heck of a lot faster, and up to an NVIDIA RTX 4070 GPU. It ships with 32 gigabytes of upgradable RAM, up to 64, as well as a one terabyte SSD drive, also upgradable to eight terabytes, for quick file transfer and storage for all your applications, and comes loaded with full IO support. So two really cool features I dig on the ProArt laptop is this touchpad is actually stylus compatible for writing or drawing, and the Asus dial, which lets you control things like brightness and volume by default, but by using the new and improved ProArt Creator Hub, you can configure the dial to adjust brush size, saturation, layer opacity, and more. For the longest time, I have needed a laptop to support my creativity on the go, and after using the Asus ProArt laptops, I am happy to say I legit vouch for these things. They can do everything from rendering complex 3D scenes in your 3D programs of choice, to editing high-res footage, or compositing in After Effects. Not to mention they're perfect for mobile gaming and LAN parties too. So click that link in the description down below to learn more about the Asus ProArt Studio Book. And lastly, I just wanna say thank you to all the artists who participated in the Asus Pro Artist Awards 2023. The contest ends today, and I cannot wait to take a look at all of your animations. Now, let's get back to the art. Now there's a handful of little tips and tricks that I use to match the light as it's such an important step. I almost always start with a high dynamic range image. HDRIs are made by stitching together a series of bracketed images, ultimately creating a 360 degree sphere of your custom environment. And we'll use this image to light our 3D scene. Ideally, I would have captured a custom HDRI for every shot I filmed, but I did not have time while on vacation, so Here's what I'll do instead. Go to HDRI Haven and grab an HDRI that resembles your scene the closest. We'll use one of these images to get our lighting to the 85% mark. Now to light our scene with this image, I'll drop it into an HDR environment object and hit render. Success. But we ain't done yet, cause let's use the path tracer to get those realistic light bounces, turn our render samples down so we don't start a forest fire, decrease the GI clamp to avoid unwanted artifacts on our reflections, and make our background transparent. To have our background image visible in the renderer and the viewport, you can create a background object via the calibration tag. BAM! We got lights, we got a camera, but let's take this lighting to the next level. First, let's add an octane camera tag to our camera and enable the camera imager. Here we can dial in the exposure, gamma, saturation, all that good stuff to better match our render to our background plate. The closer we can match this here in post, the easier our compositing job in After Effects will be. You can also enable some post glow, and of course, let's orbit our HDRI until we feel it best matches the lighting in our footage. And here's where the real spice comes in. Remember how I said the HDRI is gonna get us 85% of the way there? We'll buckle up for the other 15. Since HDRIs consider every light captured in the scene the same distance away, they're just infinitely far away, we're gonna recreate some of these lights in 3D to really spice up our scene. So I'll radially clone a couple rings of scaled down area lights, drop the intensity to a reasonable amount, and take a look at this difference. It really makes the material shine. And speaking of materials, let's bring our materials to the next level with some surface imperfections. First, I will convert our C4D materials to Octane materials. If you're using Redshift, you convert them to Redshift materials. Now, I can select all these materials and make batch edits. First, I'll take the roughness down to a really low value because I want my Lego pieces to have that nice sheen. Another thing I want to do is bevel these edges, and I can actually do that with a round edges node in these Octane materials. That way the bricks don't look as clinical. I'll just dial in a low value and make sure they're set to accurate. Next, I'll open the node editor and drop in a scratch texture from my brand new Surface Imperfections Volume 
two pack, which I got a 50% off for you guys this week only. It's 12 16-bit 4K seamless non-GMO textures at 50% off this week only. Go grab some. But yeah, this totally does the job. It makes it look like that one time you tried to pry your pieces apart with a fork or something. Next, I'll drop a smudge texture from my volume one pack into the roughness channel to get that greasy child hand all over the pieces kind of look. Now be sure to use a transform node on both of these images to control how much they tile and a projection node set to box to tile the images accurately. A multiply node out to a float texture will help you tone down the scratches and an octane gradient will help you dial in the amount of smudging. Feel free to add a dirt node up in the color channel for a bit of ambient occlusion if the situation calls. You can up the index if you want these bad boys to be a bit shinier depending on your scene and look as well. Finally, I wanna give the pieces a slight touch of positional inconsistency to them. It really helps sell the hand-built look. For this, I'll simply add a planar field with the slightest touch of positional and rotational input, making sure to set the deformation mode to object. And with a custom light setup, spice lights to double down on the ones in our footage, surface imperfections, and some random positioning on the bricks to make them feel hand-built, it's time to render this out and stick it in our footage using After Effects. Lucky for us, we only got to render one frame because it's not animated or part of a 3D track sequence. So I'm gonna just hit file, save image where you can export whatever file type you want. And if you want to split this image up into specific render layers, you can set that up by making sure Octane is selected as the renderer. And under AOV groups, you can add whatever pass you want. Say post-processing, for example, if you set up that bloom earlier, choose a destination and let's get comping in After Effects. Calling all 3D artists, if you have seen our big 3D community challenges and have been waiting for the right opportunity to join the next one, now is the time. This August, let's learn and grow together through the new Summer 3D Challenge. We got a new super fun prompt for you guys, so be sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss out on the big reveal on July 29th. So the compositing stage is truly my favorite part of this whole process because all of our setup, all of our hard work comes together here. So we'll drag our render in and the first thing we'll do is stick it to our footage. This process is called tracking, camera tracking or match moving. We'll be 2D tracking our footage with Mocha today, which comes built into After Effects. So I'll skip to the middle of our footage where we can see everything. And I'll grab our handy pen tool and draw a mask around the area we want to track. I'll first track forward, then backward. I do this because it makes for a more accurate track a lot of the times. It's situational, yes, but like, if you throw a ball from half court, you're more likely to score than if you'd thrown it from the other side of the court. You know what I mean? I don't know if that works. Once complete, just close and save. Make a null object to hold our tracking data and under the Mocha effect, we'll click Create Track Data. To ensure our layer is toggled, we'll select Transform from the dropdown and our null object to apply the data to and BAM! Pick whip the render to the null and we are locked in. Just don't forget to toggle motion blur. So since I'm actually colorblind, color matching can be difficult for me, all right? So let me show you how I'm doing it. Give your Lego a levels adjustment, select the red channel and set the composition color channel to red as well. So by removing color as a factor, we're essentially value matching our elements now, which ideally offers us a more objective way to composite. So when we switch back to color, our element should in theory be much closer than it was before. Let's zoom in and you'll notice our render is a bit more crisp than the footage. That's where a little fast blur and grain comes in. Keep it subtle though, because it doesn't take much to match the degradation of your footage. But for some shots, like this one that I filmed on my iPhone 10, the quality loss is a bit more noticeable. So I'm just stacking a few iterations of fast blur and some unsharp masks to get that crunchy iPhone look and topping it off with some grain. All right, so it is time we talked about rotoscoping, specifically, how to do it quickly because most of you guys hate it, don't have time for it, and are looking for any excuse to not be doing it. But what if the shot calls for it, like this one? These trees gotta be scoped out, you know? Normally, you would use the roto brush and go frame by frame making adjustments along the way, which honestly isn't the worst option. You could export it out to Runway ML and generate a mat to bring back into After Effects or Fusion. Also not a bad method, but I wanna show you guys one more, and it's called using a track map. First, you have to track your footage. That's number one. After that, I'll just make a solid with control Y, parent it to the track null, and before we draw a mask, make sure the solid completely covers the area you're trying to roto. That way we only have to do this once. And I'll draw that mask. 
zoom on in, get up between them leaves. We're only doing this once, so do it right, yeah? Then we duplicate our footage and reference the solid as the track mat from that footage, all right? And assuming your track is solid, you're locked in. And if your track shifts a bit, you only need to make one or two keyframes as opposed to one per frame. I use this same method to roto out all these foreground objects for this Tokyo Tower shot, but instead of a 2D tracking method, I use the After Effects camera tracker to generate solids in 3D space, since each of these elements move at different speeds because of their position in Z space. And finally, I'll hit you guys with this last one before we call it, and that is removing objects from your footage, all right? Because we don't want the original peeking out from behind our Lego version, you know? So I'm actually just gonna use Content Aware Fill in After Effects. I'll utilize the Track Matte method to roto out my subject, and with the footage selected, I'll go to Window Content Aware Fill. It's very simple and easy to use. You have three methods of removal to choose from, and Object works best for this kind of setup. So I'll just run it with default settings and see what we get. It takes a minute or so, but hey, if your results look like butt, you know, it might be beneficial to generate a reference frame where you can manually build one out in Photoshop by going to Edit Content Aware Fill and manually selecting the parts of the image Photoshop references to fill in the blank pixels, it'll look nicer than if you just sampled the whole image. And sometimes it's best to paint this out in chunks for the best results. Once you save the Photoshop file and run the fill in After Effects, it'll crunch you out a filled in background using your reference frame. Now this isn't perfect, but it's perfect for what we're using it for. This workflow is great for any 3D to 2D process because once we get to this point, iterations are as easy as adding more surface imperfections, punching up the lights maybe, even updating the old model with a new one from Paul and rendering a V2 that will auto update in After Effects with a simple alt drag. If you guys wanna double down on this workflow, I have two longer videos covering this process in Cinema 4D and After Effects, utilizing different camera tracking techniques, modeling, texturing, and lighting, the works, everything. If you learned something new with this video, let me know in the comment section below. I'm curious to know what it is. And actually, more importantly, what you didn't learn. If there's something I didn't cover, if I didn't cover correctly, let me know down below and we'll, we'll chat it out. But hey, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me and allowing yourself the time to learn and grow together. It's been chill. I will be hard at work on the short film with Paul, so subscribe to catch it when it drops. Hit up Paul's channel in the description for more LEGO builds, and I will see you guys next Saturday, July 29th, for the reveal of the new 3D Community Challenge. Buckle up for it, y'all. It's gonna be big. I'll see you guys soon. Peace.